Thank you, Deborah, over there on the piano. That was lovely. Ooh, Labor Day weekend. We're so glad to be home, but we did have a good time at the beach. It was beautiful. Barbara had a great birthday. I bought her the best flowers ever. <laughs> you probably saw them on Facebook. Yeah, so we had a great time. It's always good to be home. One thing that happens to me when we take our week off is at the beginning of the week, I'm so tired, I just sleep. <laughs> And I sleep, and I sleep, and then I start to wake up, and then I start to think. <laughs> and I've gotten some great thoughts uh, after that time of being rested. So it's always a good time. And this time I was, uh, I was thinking, and what I was thinking about was uh, that I'm, next week I'm going to be uh, back in, in Denver, in Golden, working with the staff. And as president of Centers for Spiritual Living, I am sort of directly responsible for the staff. I find I'm not a, a, a world-class executive, but I do like to work with them on, on, on spiritual matters. And so we, usually, we often get together and we do a thing that I learned when I was getting my PhD. In fact, I, I did my dissertation on it. It's a process called open space. And you may or may not know it. I'll give you a quick idea of what it is. But we did one there. And uh, we're getting ready to meet next week and go through some of the things that we're looking at. So I was thinking about that. I and mean, in thinking about open space and how it works, uh, I, I really wanted to, uh, to, to make, make it work the best I could in that environment. Not everybody thought it was working the best it could, but as I looked and reflected on what we did, I was thinking, yes, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And, and what it is, is it's, it's a process that was created for uh, uh, meetings on any topic. It's been used all over the world. Uh, it, it has been, I mean, a hundred thousand times it's been used uh, in groups to resolve things from uh, uh, keeping countries from going to civil war to uh, uh, working at issues with uh, municipalities uh, to just small communities using it. So it's a, to me it's a very powerful process and everything we use to do the process to me has value in our lives and that's kind of what I was looking at last week is that there's these, these ideas that this thing is built around are, are really valuable to how we live our lives in a spiritual way. So, let me give you an idea just what it is. Most meetings you come, you've got an agenda, you've got set breakout sessions, you've got all that in your program, you go do your thing, blah, blah, blah. And then what in, in, you take home with you, the interesting thing that happened was over dinner or drinks or while you were having coffee with somebody, something popped. And that became important in your life. Yet, everything else that you did that was all planned, nothing really stuck. So what if the whole thing was designed around those kinds of experiences of what's going to pop right now? So the way it's organized is there is a topic, some things at hand, something that everyone in the room is interested in. And the room is set up in concentric circles, so everybody's facing toward the middle. And the facilitator explains that what's going to happen is everybody's going to get, that wants to, can, can have a breakout group on whatever topic that is relevant to the major topic that we're having. And there's a system for writing things down and announcing it and going to a, a place where you can pick a time and a location for your, for your time. And that's all just fine and good and it looks pretty chaotic when it's happening, but there are some principles that, it, that are adhered to to make this thing work. There are four guiding principles and one law. And I want to share this with you because I think they have enormous value to us in life. So, life lessons from open space. The first guiding principle of open space is whoever comes is the right people. And of course, in that design means whoever decides to go over and talk about what you want to talk about and join that little group is the right people to talk about. It. Why would that be? Well, because they have an interest. They're interested in learning about it, finding out about it, seeing something, maybe finding some solutions. They're invested. They're interested in the process. Well, in life, it kind of works the same way. It works the same way in the sense that the people around you are a reflection of you, and they are the right people. Now, that's easy to say with somebody you're happy with. But what about the people you're not happy with? What about the people that annoy you? What about the people that... Uh, uh, they give you grief in your life. They're the right people too. They are a perfect reflection of your consciousness. That doesn't make you wrong. That means there's something to know. There's something to learn. There's something of value. 
Because people don't come into your life to give you grief for the sake of giving you grief. What's happening is, this is an opportunity for you to know something about yourself. I've come to the conclusion that spiritual living, creative living, whatever you want to call it, is all about becoming aware of who we are as individuals. Because we are the presence of the divine. And not one of us in this room or any room anywhere on this planet really knows that. We're all finding it. We're all learning about it. We're all exploring it. But we haven't found it yet. It's not complete. If it was complete, we wouldn't need to be here. We're all still here. We're all still creating relationships. We're all still doing things in our lives. Therefore, there's still things to know about us, about who we are. And the people in our lives are a perfect reflection of who we are. Now, if you're surrounded by people that you just adore and they adore you and everything is going on, keep doing that. Keep doing that. But chances are there's somebody in your life that can hook you. They are your blessing. They are calling you to know deeper and more clearly who you are and why you have come here. Another thing about this one, whoever comes is the right people, is that you don't have to be in the group. If it's a, an organization of some sort, you don't have to be in the group with the CEO or the president to get things done. The idea is whoever shows up can get something done if that's their intention. Now, if they've just come together to complain, that's different. Then all they can do is complain. But if the consciousness of the group can rise above the situation into the solution with different thinking, then something enormous can happen. And what I've discovered in this open space process is that some of the best ideas come from the folks that make the least amount of money in the organization. The people who clean the place. The people who fix the food. The people who answer the phone. Those are the people that actually know what's going on. Better than some of the people with the fancy titles. So isn't it cool that at that level, when you're playing on a, on a level playing field where everybody is the right people, that what you get out of that is everybody has a voice. Everybody has a say. So what I'm saying to you is, is when there's someone who's barking in your life, why don't you try listening? Seeing what they have to say. I found that incredibly valuable. That sometimes it's the one that I would really like to go away that has such a strong message for me. That I would just shut up and listen for a little time that I'll get some enormous thing. If it is true that God is all there is, then that person that's barking at you, that's creating that annoyance in your life, is, is God. And why would God go to all the trouble of barking at you? <laughs> to get your attention. Because there's something to know. So all the people in your life are the right people. When you have worked out whatever it is you can work out with that person, when you can get everything out of them that, that you need to know about yourself, they will go away. Or they will get really different in their relationship with you. It's you that controls that. They're not doing it to you. It's so easy to point at somebody and say, that's the problem. It's not. There's really not a problem. There's an opportunity to get something if we can just have that perspective to look at. So that's the first guiding principle of open space. The second guiding principle of open space is when it starts as the right time. Now that sounds like a perfect thing to talk about with a, uh, uh, with a group of people that are meeting for a finite period of time. Um, the idea is don't get angry uh, if somebody shows up late or if the group starts late. I remember once I, I had these, I, I was, when I was doing this, learning this, I was going to these transformation uh, things. The Fourth of July week, uh, I went when I was working on my PhD. Every every Fourth of July week, I would go and be with all these crazy uh, OT people. And and one time, I went to lunch and, and lost track of time and came back and walked into a room. People were all looking at me, and I go, "Whenever it starts is the right time." Oh, okay, <laughs> and we got past that. But the point, the life lesson that comes with this is kind of extraordinary to me because there are opportunities to realize in your life that things aren't about a clock, that things aren't about a calendar, that there's a natural, unflowing form of life that if you will become attuned to it, it will work with you. Has anyone here ever thought, I should have had this handled by now? <laughs> All of us. I get those thoughts too. 
but they're subsiding in me. And that's because I'm seeing over and over again in my life that when something is there and I'm going, oh, we should handle that, maybe it's not time yet to handle it. And I have a lovely example that happened this last week. I do a Wednesday teleconference call, and anyone that wants to can come on the call. It's, it's a lot of ministers, practitioners, and leaders of communities come on, and we talk about different topics. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about diversity and spiritual living and how that applied. And it was a lively conversation, and we did some good work. And after the call, I got an email. And it was very short and direct. It's, uh, it says, I am curious as to why there has been no mass email about the tragedy in Ferguson, Ferguson, Missouri. Now, we do from time to time when there are things happening in the world, uh, there are uh, uh, emails that go out. So this person's wondering why not about this. But when there's a school shooting or a flood crisis in a, in a majority white community, you send out concerns. Is this the type of diversity you speak of? Hmm. So I read that, and I wanted to write back. And I, and I realized that have I, had I written back, I would have scolded this person. Or I would have said, not my problem, I don't write those, he does, pointing to our spiritual leader. Who at the time happened to be in Geneva for a conference. And I think they get emails in Geneva, but I don't care. The point was is that I got real quick that although there was something compelling in me that wanted me to respond, I need to pray about this. So that's what I did. I took it into prayer. I thought about it. I meditated on it. And I realized that this person that wrote this to me had something going on inside of them, something they were struggling with around that. I don't know the person, so I, I can't tell you who they were. I got a name, but I, I still don't know who the person is. And then, while Barbara and I were at the beach, after Ken had come back from his uh, uh, time, he sent out an email. He sent it to over 4,000 ministers, practitioners, and other leaders. And in it, there was this paragraph. It, and I did not talk to him about this at all. It is difficult to read or write about the social implications of the events in Ferguson, Missouri, or in other places in the world without calling to mind similar events that have occurred in the past, or perhaps in our individual lives, that remind us that opening of old wounds continues to point out the need for radical change, but not only in society, but in our psyche. It is in this realm of mind that members and friends of Centers for Spiritual Living have something to offer, a worldwide view of essential oneness and connection. I was so happy. So then I did respond, just to let this person know that sometimes it comes a little slower than we'd like, but the answer always comes. I haven't heard back, but that's fine. It was a, it was a good move. And I mentioned in that that I had not spoken with Dr. Ken. This didn't come out of any need that someone had pointed out that we had wronged or not done something appropriate. But things are in perfect order. They're unfolding as they should. I also had the opportunity to sit uh, on a plane yesterday from uh, Atlanta to Asheville uh, with a, an executive from Microsoft Corporation. And uh, he was talking about the corporate world. He talked about how early in his life, when he was in his 20s, he, he had this order of things that had to happen and they had to happen now, and how miserable his life was. <laughs> and now that he's in his 40s and uh, approaching his 50s, that He's, he's let a lot of that go. Even though it's still part of the corporate world. They have deadlines. You know, they want that by the end of the day. So the corporate world, and Microsoft in particular, has apparently come up with a, a way of dealing with these, these deadlines when, where some supervisor or superior says, I want that on my, on my desk or in my email by the end of the day. What do you do? Well, they call it a Wagner. Wagner. Yeah, somebody may have heard of that. Wagner stands for wild, eyes get, wild ass guesses not easily refuted. <laughs> this apparently is policy at Microsoft. So how valuable is a, is a wild ass guess? 
man, whatever. The point being that if we're going to bring the quality to our lives, it's not about a calendar and it's not about a clock. It's about focusing on what is before you to do and doing whatever it is well. That's the work. That's the work. So when it starts is the right time. The third of our open space guiding principles, whatever happens, is the only thing that could have. When it, whatever happens is the only thing that could have, could happen, which means that whatever happened just now or before, that was it. That was the only thing you're going to get. It could not have been different. I hear a lot of people talk when they're trying to reconcile their, their growing up that their parents did the best they could. I, I reject that. I think our parents did the only thing they could have with what they knew and with what you, who you were. That's all they could do. That was it. And you got exactly what you needed to get. Again, to know who you are. Uh, if, you, you, uh, if we broke this room in half, half of us would, would say, and I'm guessing on the half, but some of us would say that, that we learn from our parents by modeling their ways, and others would say we learn from our parents by doing the exact opposite of what they did. What does it matter as long as we learn? Is one way harder than the other? Perhaps. But there's something about the grist of life that still has value. Nobody wants it, yet it's there. It's natural. So when something happens, the idea of making it wrong, the idea of judging it and finding fault in it, will not get you where you want to go. What will get you where you want to go is that something happened. Where can I find God in that? Where can I find something that helps me know who I am in that? It's always there. At least it has been in my life, and I can't imagine that your experiences are that different from mine. So that if you look at your life, and something is not unsettled with you, look deeper. Because what happened is the only thing that could have for you to get what you needed to get to know who you are. Whatever happened, it's the only thing that could have. There's a powerful idea in that that keeps us from falling into making things wrong. Barbara has done this amazing thing of late. And I think it comes out of this happiness work that she's been doing. She has decided not to find fault in people and the things they do. That was homework from last Sunday. Aha! <laughs> there you go. It was homework from last Sunday. She is a master of this. I watched her do it all week with some of the people that we saw in Miami. And Miami is that kind of place where you get to practice this in an amazing way. <laughs> the last one that happened before, uh, well actually this happened in Atlanta. On our, before we were waiting to get on the plane here, a, uh, a porter pulled up with a woman in a wheelchair. A woman was dressed in a very fancy dress. She wasn't. Uh, she was probably in her in her fifties, let's say. And he pulled her up, and she's in the wheelchair. And he says to her, "Stay here, and one of the gate agents will help you get onto the plane when the time is right." She says, "Okay," and she sits there. And the gate agent makes an announcement. Now it's time for anyone who needs assistance to come and, and come onto the plane. Nobody came over to her. So she got up and she picked up her duffel bag and flung it over her arm and she went on the plane. <laughs> and I looked at this woman. There was nothing wrong with her. I'm thinking. And I looked at Barbara and I said, did you see that? And she said, yes, isn't it wonderful that we live in a country where people can have instantaneous healing. <laughs> I'm not getting home. That was brilliant. So I had those experiences happen absolutely all week. They were wonderful. Our work is to recognize is that what's going on in our life is not wrong. It is not bad. We are not being punished. There are not evil people around us trying to get us. What is happening, what has happened to you, is the only thing that could happen with your consciousness. And I find no fault in you for having that consciousness. Everything is a spiritual experience. Your job is to find God in it. My job is to find God in my life. Every single day. Every single experience. And when you do that, your life gets rich. And the experiences you have start to change. And you don't get hooked. 
and you live in a world that is wonderful and delightful. That's the word, the third guiding principle of open space. The fourth one is, when it's over, it's over. Isn't that a great idea? There are things in life that need to end. If you've ever heard me or Barbara or anyone speak on the Native American medicine wheel, it's a brilliant idea. It's a circle. And the idea is that it starts in the East. In most traditions, it starts in the East. And the East is the place of new beginnings. Something new, something fresh, something pure spirit shows up in our lives, and we go with it. Sometimes it's, the, it's, the, it's a birth. It's that physical human birth. Sometimes it's the birthing of something else. And we go with it, and it's wonderful, and we are excited about it. And where we go from there is that our life grows in that experience. Something evolves out of that and becomes more and more interesting and full. That's the work we do in the South. In the West, we find that this, too, includes challenges that we must learn to overcome, to change, to learn about who we are so that we move through our challenges, and then we go to the North where we have the wisdom of that experience. That's the circle, but of course it has to go back to the East, and what must happen for the East to come? Something has to end, because something new has to be born. A couple of interesting ideas around this. I think I announced this to you a couple of weeks ago. There's been a, a decision by leadership in our organization to discontinue publishing Science of Mind magazine. No, 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 Creative Thought magazine. Creative Thought magazine. Oh, well, no, that's okay. No, there are lots of folks, there are lots of folks that love that magazine. The challenge is not as many people as used to. So we're losing about $80,000 a year on this thing. Can't do it. It just doesn't make good business sense to lose that kind of money. Of course, when we announced it, all of the, I don't know, 3,000 people that read it religiously every single day, they were angry. They were not happy. And there were some uh, minds that, that, that had you know, put out ideas like, this is the way it works. If we can't do this and do it well, we're not going to do it. And, and all the upset that I experienced was quite amazing. Yet, everyone seems to be more working toward this idea that this is something, even after 60 years, it's something, this time has come to an end. Now, we may find a new way to present those daily treatments. I loved them. I, we used to use them when I would teach spiritual mind treatment. I would always use the Creative Thought magazine because it had treatments in it. And you could see the steps and you could learn it through that. And it was always an interesting conversation. So it was a great teaching tool. And we have in our archives 60 years of, of daily treatments. I mean, somebody calculated 365 times 60. That's a lot of treatments. There's a lot of wisdom in all of that. So we're not losing that. We're actually going to make it available online. And we may actually put together some kind of something about a daily treatment rather than putting them in a magazine and actually send them out. We have 15,000 people right now that would be delighted, I think, to receive a daily treatment. So those kind of things will happen. The form is changing. But the thing that we have known, that paper copy that we got every month, and it's time for it to end. It's over. And learning, being with that is something that some people struggle with. You know, and that's 60 years. And you should expect some people to have a little trouble letting go of that. And then you have things you have to let go of right quick. Like maybe even before you get them going. Two weeks ago I stood here and I said, on the 13th of September, we are going to do uh, a World Day of Service because Centers for Spiritual Living is sponsoring this World Day of Service, and many of our centers are going to participate by doing this. I didn't put a lot of thought into that. A little bit of thought. I know that our beloved Chuck Hunter goes out and, and feeds people, goes to different parts of the city and feeds people. He makes, makes these wonderful, quite delicious uh, baked potatoes with all the toppings and all, and people love it and show up to eat his food. I thought, Chuck, let's just do this for our center, and that'll be fun. And then I started thinking about it, because one of the places, well, where do you want to do it? And I said, well, where, where do you think? He said, well, there's a place in Asheville where all the Christian churches go every week and hand out free food. No, oh, that doesn't make it very special, does it? You know, ooh, we're having a world day of service, and we're going to do what all the Christian churches do every week. We're going to do it one week. <laughs> no, that's not it. Now, Chuck's got this down with science. He goes every month and does this, so he's in that group. He's doing it. But for us to piggyback on it left me feeling a little empty. 
I, we got a, a proclamation that came from another city where a, a, the city of Las Vegas actually put out this wonderful proclamation for World Day of Service. And I read that and I go, oh, we're just not ready to receive this. So what I've worked out with Chuck is that we're not going to do that. We're going to do it next year. And we're going to do it really well. We're going to put, put a lot of time and thought into it and create something that we can really be proud of. But not this year. It didn't work. So we're going to let that one go. This is the work that we do. We look at what needs to get done. And when something is not right to happen, we let it go. Letting go is a very important part of who we are. Because when we get stuck on something having to happen, we burden ourselves. So we move beyond that. That's the fourth guiding principle of open space. We have only four, four guiding principles, but there's one other thing to talk about, and that's the law, the law of two feet. This applies in, the, in the, the open space work because we have all these breakout groups, and you can go to one and sit there and realize that you are neither contributing nor receiving anything of value by there. You're bored. And the rule is, the law is, get up, use your two feet, and go somewhere else where you can experience something more productive, where you can be more of a contributor. That's the law of two feet. But isn't that true in our lives? How often do we waste our time thinking we're supposed to do something, we're supposed to have something happen that we're supposed to just drone ourselves through rather than being productive, rather than participating in something meaningful in life. When we do meaningful things, wonderful outcomes occur. That's the work. And there's another piece to this. What comes out of, of the law of two feet is that you observe people who are bumblebees and butterflies. Bumblebees are people that go from group to group cross-pollinating. That's, that's a, a productive thing, bringing ideas to different places. So if you see somebody who's there some of the time, chances are they're somewhere else sharing your ideas with them and getting ready to bring some ideas back to you. It's okay. Let the bumblebees be. Now, as far as butterflies, aren't they beautiful? What do they do? <laughs> but they're doing something, you know? So in an open space, if they're standing by the water fountain, they're having a cup of coffee with one person over there, don't go, what are you doing? Are you not participating? That's none of your business. So in the world, when we are around butterflies and we don't know what they do, it doesn't matter. It's none of our business. Let's focus on what we do. Let's create something wonderful in our lives. Now these make for a great open uh, communication experience. But to me, these are things we can use in our lives every day. So I hope there was something in this that touches your heart that maybe gives you an angle on how you can be more current, more present, more fully engaged in your life so that your life is that rich, beautiful experience that I know it can be. That's what we're all shooting for, isn't it? I really appreciate your attention today. God bless you all. That was fun.